Hello, um, welcome to the Frontotemporal Dementia um, Support Group meeting. My name is Dr. Jonathan Rohrer. I'm a, a neurologist. I work at uh, UCL and at the National Hospital um, at Queen Square. Welcome back to those of you that have been to our meetings before and a, a great welcome to those of you that are new um, to these meetings. Um, as um, those of you that have been before will know our meetings have been like this online um, and virtual um, since the start um, of the COVID pandemic. And I, we've had a really great response to um, having virtual meetings. And we recognize that, that some people have been able to attend who weren't able to attend any of our um, in-person meetings before. And so the plan moving forward is that we will have um, a, a, a blended approach to how we do things. We will carry on with more um, virtual meetings, um, but we'll be going back to some face-to-face. -face. We recognize that people like meeting um, other people um, in these meetings. And you know we think that, that that kind of peer support that people get from meeting other people that are in the same situation and have been through the same things is also really um, important. And so the plan will be, we will try to go back to that when we can. Um, it, it, it is very likely um, if we go along the way we are that our annual seminar, um, which is always in March and has been for many years, will be a face-to-face -face meeting um, next year. So um, uh, in March um, 2022. Um, one thing to say is um, next year um, there will be an international um, meeting um, for Frontier Temple Dementia that happens um, every two years um, and um, next year it's actually going to be um, not far away um, in Paris and, and Lille shared between those two um, cities um, and there will be one day um, aimed at carers um, and so um, we will be involved in that. Nikki, um, who many of you know, um, will be involved um, in setting up that day. And um, if anyone has any ideas of things they would like to do or anyone is interested um, in um, going along to that, um, then do um, let us know. We'll, we'll try and provide some more information when we know exactly um, what's going on um, with that meeting, but it'll be one day um, in autumn. Um, of 2022 um, and will be probably in, in Paris. So we have um, a, 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 um, a, a set of talks today that really um, are aiming to think about the, the different stages um, of frontotemporal dementia. And we have an amazing set of um, speakers and, and talks. We're always open to um, thinking about the kind of talks that you would like to hear in these meetings and the kind of things you would like to um, get out of them. So please do, as always, um, let us know. Please feed back to us um, about the kind of things you would like to hear. Um, but we're going to hear um, about um, getting support after diagnosis um, in the early stages um, and then thinking about some, some things, um, more difficult things around some of the later stages. Um, around palliative care and swallowing and, and communication. And, and I'll introduce everybody as we go, but all of our speakers will be um, on um, the panel um, uh, later on. And we really um, would um, get people to answer, start asking questions um, in the chat from, from any point onwards. So if there's something you hear that you're not sure about, um, or if there is something um, there's a topic that comes up that you'd like to hear about. It doesn't need to be about um, one of the talks today. It can be anything about FTD at all. We'll try and cover it um, in the Q&A session um, at the end in the last um, 45 minutes. So um, without further ado, um, I'm going to um, uh, introduce the first talk, which is on post-diagnostic support in the early stages from um, Nikki Zimmerman, um, and Olivia Wood, um, who uh, many of you will know um, from our, our um, rare dementia support and direct support team. Many of you will have been in, in touch with them. And they're going to um, talk just for the first 10 minutes um, a bit about the, the kind of support that you might get. 
Good morning, everybody. It's fantastic to be here with the July FTD webinar. For those of you who haven't met me, I'm Nikki Zimmerman, and I'm here today with my lovely colleague. Hi, everyone. I'm Olivia or Livy Wood, and I'm absolutely delighted to be here speaking with Nikki today. Fantastic. So we're going to tell you what we're going to be talking about today. But first of all, I really need to make this very clear here because we are talking about post-diagnostic support and you are not alone. We are here for you. We're going to be talking today primarily about supporting people in the early stages. Now, uh, me and Livy are part of the direct support team, and we are here to help navigate you through your whole journey. And this is quite often we start with people at pre-diagnosis navigation to enable them to see a specialist to get that correct and specific diagnosis. And then we support people all the way through, right through to post-bereavement support as well when that is needed. So as I said, I'm part of the direct support team. I lead a fantastic, wonderful team. I'm so lucky to work with these amazing people. There's a variety of skill sets and an absolute fountain of expert knowledge. If you haven't had any support from any of my team yet, please do get in contact. Now, we are here with Livy today, and Livy has an amazing and vast experience in FTD, in supporting people. She's got personal experience and she's got fantastic professional experience as well. And she is my queen of coping strategies. Oh, thank you, Nikki. And I'm yet to find a member who hasn't already spoken to Nikki. She is wonderful. She has extensive experience in our neurology clinics and also supporting people in care homes and also has some amazing personal um, knowledge of dementia also. So moving on to today's focus and what are we going to be talking about? Why are we here? So three things which are very important. First being post-diagnostic support and we're going to talk a little bit about the impact of getting a diagnosis, the importance of education and then on to support and planning. So what support is available, whether this is locally or nationally? What is registering as a carer and why is that so important? And then things like driving and why that's important to mention also. Finally, on to transitioning. So thinking about adaptations and strategies and how your life may have changed because of a diagnosis of FTD, whether it's yourself living with a diagnosis or whether that's your family and friends living around you. So we're going to start off talking about post-diagnostic support and the impact of that diagnosis and who's involved. So the impact, clearly, the person that's had the diagnosis, the impact on them and what that actually means to them. But also the carers, the spouses, the partners, the children, maybe the parents, maybe the siblings as well or the family, it does have a real impact on the whole of the family. But we're looking outside the family as well. Uh, the social circles, who are those important people in people's mm -hmm. lives? It might be people are still at work. It might be their friends. So it's looking where that impact ripples and all the effects from it. Now, one of the um, common features of FTD, it doesn't always happen, but it is a common feature, is people with, lack, with FTD do, do lack insight. They don't think there's anything wrong with them. They feel that they're fine. They don't need any support. So this is just a bit of a caveat for you carers that you may feel very alone in this. We are here to support you, um, but you, know, you might be looking for this support on your own. And who supports you? This is vitally important that you know who's involved in your care. You've got your GP, who's the gatekeeper, who did the diagnosis? Was it a psychiatrist? Was it a neurologist? And are they going to continue supporting you and monitoring you? Have they got a team? Are there a team of dementia specialist nurses, speech and language therapists? It's really important to work out who that network is and what they do for you and if they work together to build up that tag team of support around you. And equally as important is education and understanding FTD and what it is. Because the behavioural and psychological symptoms of FTD can fluctuate greatly, even across the course of a day, depending on variables like environment or fatigue even. And professional advice is valuable in the management of FTD. And 
carers may be able to problem solve on their own. They may be even able to cope effectively for a relatively long time. But as FTD progresses, there is absolutely no substitute for the advice of specialists like the direct support team who really understand the complexities of the presenting symptoms and variation of FTD. So as Nikki mentioned, cognitive impairments themselves might not be modifiable, particularly true if people living with FTD have limited insight into their condition. Therefore, we're thinking about interventions such as psychosocial, environmental adjustments, improved communication and reliance on remaining strengths and again educating and informing carers to enable them to adjust their own expectations and their own behaviours. And I'm going to talk a little bit about this further in a bit. And it's important to remember that we're dealing with a progressive condition here and the goalposts are always moving. So we need to be constantly vigilant. Finally, this last bullet point, embrace the compulsions. It's really important to remember that compulsions, repetitive behaviors, obsessions, are not within the person's fun full control as the, as the function of their frontal lobes, which helps us manage our impulses, helps us manage our behavior, has been damaged by the disease. So what we say, if there's no risk, embrace it, embrace these compulsions. If somebody living with FTD likes to do the same walk every day at a particular time, great, that's brilliant. If they like doing the same board game again and again, embrace it. As long as there is no risk, embrace these compulsions. So let's start talking about support and planning then. And what support is available for you locally and nationally? When you're new to a diagnosis, you have no idea where to go for support. Uh, but you found us and we're national, so that's really good. We are, we like to think that, you know, we're specialised in rare dementias. We work with fantastic clinicians and researchers. And, you know, we are very sort of clinically informed because of this. But we work with lots of local teams as well. And it's really important to find where those local teams are in your community. So, for example, the Alzheimer's Society, great for information great for letting you know what's going on in your area. And we really do work in partnership with these. You know, they've got the local knowledge, we've got the expert knowledge, it works well together. And the carer centre as well. Care, you know, carer centres is invaluable resource for carers, as is activity organisations like Age UK. They're also good for information and advice. You know, they, there's various different services that these local services provide in your community, and they are commissioned by the local authorities, so please do use them. One of the most important things I would speak to a carer about is registering as a carer. It opens so many doors, registering with the local authority, registering with the GP, you'll get double appointments, you'll get fast track to appointments um, and registering with a carer centre to, to enable you to have that respite when you need it and to see what services are there to look after you as a carer. The a fantastic resource that they have is this little card which you can carry around with you and it's an emergency carer's card so god forbid anything happened to you 72 hours of emergency care will be put into place so if nothing else it's a bit of peace of mind there now when we're looking at those community services it's really important for as soon as possible to have a needs assessment. And lots of people think, why do we need this? We don't have any needs. And if you don't have any needs, then that's absolutely fantastic. But what a needs assessment actually looks at, and most people think it's there to look at whether you can eat and drink properly on your own and you know, wash and dress on your own. It's not there for that in particular, it's there to look at any gaps are there, to meet any needs so you can live a fulfilled life. And that's what we want. Whilst the progression of sort of the dementia um, sets in, you know, you have got rights and entitlements as you go along. There's welfare, there's benefits, there's areas which you might need a little bit of help for. And it's really important that you get support here. We have a fantastic team member called Trish. And um, some of you will have spoken to Trish. She is amazing. She's our rights and entitlements officer. Um, and she would be more than happy to speak to any of you. Now I'm going to bring up driving. The bowl of contention is driving. Do we have to tell the DVLA? 
Yes, I'm afraid you do. As soon as you have the diagnosis, you have to inform the DVLA. It's a legal obligation. If you get caught, you could have a hefty fine. Now it's up to the DVLA to decide whether you, the loved one with FTD, can continue to drive. And many people do. Some can't. They just need to know that you're safe. So they'll get medical advice on this and they might send you to an assessment centre as well to have an assessment to see if you are safe. Now, I'm just going to put a bit of a warning out there with COVID happening over the last you know, 18 months. There is a huge backlog here. So if you are in that process, a bit of patience is needed because um, it's going to take a little bit of time to work through this. Now, I'm just going to finish off my bit here about talking about planning for the future. And I think this is really important that you plan as much as you can for the future without being overwhelmed. But you consider living for today as well. That is so, so important to not be too overwhelmed of what's going to happen and forget what is actually happening at the moment. And I know it can be really difficult at times to really sort of focus on what are the good things in your life. And we can help sort of put some things into place for you. And clearly, sort of with the planning for the future, lasting power is a very important resource that you need to get in place. It's a legal document, but it will give peace of mind for you and your family of what is going to happen in the future. So talking about transitioning now, and I think the first thing to acknowledge is receiving a diagnosis or a family member receiving a diagnosis is acknowledging that life has changed. There is changes in dynamics of personal relationships and these often do accompany the onset of FTD, regardless of the age of onset. And we understand that this can sometimes contribute to emotional strain of caring for someone with this condition. Marital relationships in particular might be affected because of changes in intimacy, but also changing in relationships between children and a parent living with dementia, especially if the child or the young adult is unable to understand, and there also might maybe changes with work or employment. FTD presents unique management challenges to carers, family members, and healthcare professionals. And while pharmacological approaches are sometimes used, non-medication strategies are the preferred management approach for nearly all psychological symptoms of dementia and they also help us identify the underlying causes of these behaviors rather than just treating the symptoms alone and a person-centered problem-solving approach can help us ensure that you're employing strategies effectively and tailored to your loved one we have to be a little bit like detectives. We've got to think a bit more creatively. Sometimes we ourselves as carers, as healthcare professionals, trigger unwanted responses, can trigger agitation because of our approach or attitudes towards somebody living with dementia in a given scenario. Maybe we have unrealistic expectations of the person or our care delivery and strategies aren't being tailored to their preferences, their abilities or their strengths. So. In addition to managing symptoms, carers' well-being must be taken into consideration. And this may include forms of support, including things like respite care, support groups, or even signposting to individual counselling. Now, thinking a bit about um, adaptations and strategies for common behavioural symptoms. So, for example, consider aggression and agitation, which is quite a common one which comes to us, Nikki, isn't it? One of the first things which I like to discuss is maybe matching tasks and activities to a person's strength and to avoid frustration. And then maybe thinking, is this activity necessary? And if so, how can we modify it to make it easier or less intrusive in order to reduce those triggers? One of the things which comes to us a lot is bathing. Is it necessary to um, have a bath every single day? Personally, I don't think so. And Nikki's agreeing with me, so that's brilliant. And what can we do to make that situation a lot nicer? How can we make that a very pleasurable experience? Can we engage all the senses? Can we make it a very luxurious experience? It's important to remember here that not every strategy will work for every affected individual and not every strategy will work every time it's applied. And each case and each situation needs an individually tailored response. And I think it's fair to say that the direct support team, we are always learning from our members. You guys are the experts. And what have I learned from family carers, 
living with FTD, one of the main things is don't try to reason with your loved one if he or she is unable to do so. The next one, again, particularly important, choosing your battles and modifying your own expectations rather than expecting that the person is the way he or she was before their diagnosis. This acceptance can be slow, but it's often the key in setting you free there. And one, one of my all time favorite quotes here is playing the game. And this comes from one of our members with a diagnosis of dementia. And he says, it's all about playing the game of dementia. The direct support team are with you every single step of the way. I cannot emphasize this enough. We're here to help attend to all the needs of all the parties affected by FTD throughout the duration of their illness. Thank you for listening to us today. And remember, you're not alone on this journey. Please, if you're feeling isolated, always here to help. We're going to get some questions in for us and we'll be more than happy to answer them today. Thank you. Great. So thank you so much for that first talk. We're actually going to do all the questions um, at the end. So I can see that many of you, thank you very much for putting um, questions into, uh, into the chat already. Um, I've seen them all. We're going to get them all together and we'll do all of those at the Q&A session at the end. So um, moving on, um, we're going to hear now um, a little bit about the later stages. And just to start with, um, we're going to hear from Ali Rosisk, who um, works in palliative care um, and is going to tell you a little bit about um, a research opportunity. Um, after that, we'll, we'll hear from somebody else. I'll introduce that. But let's first hear from Ali Rose. Hi, everyone. My name is Ali Rosisk and I'm a second year PhD student at UCL, University College London. And I'm also a staff nurse here um, in the UK with a huge interest in all things dementia care and palliative care. So my PhD here at UCL is all about exploring the palliative care needs of people with frontotemporal dementia or FTD. And as part of my PhD project, I'm going to be looking at um, better understanding the physical, psychological, social and spiritual needs of people living with moderate to severe stages of uh, FTD. And this is all to contribute to developing better and best care for people living with FTD. So as part of my research, um, I will be collecting information around physical, psychological, social and spiritual symptoms from people with FTD or their carers. And I'll be collecting this data at baseline. So when I meet you initially, um, and then every three months for nine months. So there'll be four data collection points. Um, so who am I looking to speak to at, at this time? Well, I'm looking to speak to RDS members with lived experience of uh, late stage or moderate to late stage FTD. So this is likely to be perhaps family carers, uh, relatives, friends of those with FTD. And I'm looking to speak to you. The data collection points will last about an hour and can run online, of course, now with COVID and all that. Um, the data collection can happen online, or perhaps in a room at UCL. And I'm going to be um, meeting you to conduct these interviews. But the overall study is led by Professor Liz Sampson, who is a consultant psychiatrist uh, here and she's at UCL. So if you're interested, you think you might know someone that's interested or perhaps you've more questions for me, then you can contact me directly on my email, which is just at the bottom, or even my phone, um, which is also here at the bottom. I'd be very happy to answer any questions at all around the study. And I suppose I'd be looking to recruit 25 to 30 people uh, to this study. And the more people we have, the more information we can collect on the experiences of those with FTD and the better care, of course, we can provide, which is the the overarching aim of this type of work. So I really look forward to hearing from you all and thank you so much for listening today. If anyone is interested um, in that, um, please do contact um, Ali Rose. If you uh, miss the information, remember that um, uh, today's being recorded, you'll get a link out. But if you want to know and you've missed the um, email address from Ali Rose, um, just drop um, any of our, our, our team um, an email and they can send out the details um, about Ali Rose's um, study. I, it, it's really important that we do understand um, this area better. It, it, it's um, very little research um, in the area, specifically on frontotemporal dementia, so great if people can um, get involved in that. 
So let's um, move on. Um, we're now going to hear about um, really later stage needs, particularly um, around communication and swallowing. We've got two um, really excellent speakers from our, our team. Many of you will know um, Anna Volkmer, who is a, a speech and language therapist, who has a real um, specialist um, interest and knowledge um, about um, language problems in dementia in general, but specifically language problems um, in frontotemporal dementia and primary progressive um, aphasia. And, and, and Hannah Gardner, who has been with us for a little while now, who is um, an Admiral nurse um, and is integrated within um, our um, RDS team. So let's um, hear from them and you'll get the opportunity to ask them some questions um, at the end in the Q&A um, as well. Hi everybody, and thank you for having us here today. My name is Anna Volkmer. I am a senior speech and language therapist and I work at the National Hospital for Neurology and Neurosurgery. I'm also a researcher and I also work with rare dementia support. And I'm here with Hannah. Hi everyone, I'm Hannah Gardner. I'm an admiral nurse at the rare dementia support team. Um, I'm also a registered general nurse um, with a passion for sort of later stages of dementia. And my role is to really support families living with a rare dementia. Thank you, Hannah. And we're here today to talk to you about communication in the later stages of frontotemporal dementia. But before we go into that detail, we thought we'd talk to you a little bit about what to expect. So our presentation today is going to be quite practical. Um, but what we wanted to just touch on is that as a person with frontotemporal dementia changes over time, this can impact on their language. So this can impact on a person's ability to think of words, can impact on their ability to understand words, understand writing and read. And so often over time, that person becomes either quieter or the words and language they may use might not be as accurate or there may not be as much content. Alongside that, we often see that a person's broader communication skills might change. So they might not understand when to take a turn. They might not understand what, what to say that's appropriate. They might not understand to keep a topic going. And um, that can really link in with their behavioral changes as well. Also, sort of as someone progresses um, to the later stages of FTD is also looking at the physical implication as well. Some people can become more rigidy, so this can cause a lot of stiffness and reflexing muscles can be more harder to do. And that increases the risk of someone falling. So it's then, yeah, can be looking at their environment, sort of trip hazards. So it's how do you manage someone who actually now has a physical condition as well. And then also as sort of progress into later stages, swallowing can become an issue as, as someone's ability to eat and drink, um, the risk of coughing when um, drinking clear fluids and the right consistency of food as well as about getting the right balance and that's when it's important so things like speech and language therapies are involved to assess someone's swallowing as they progress into later stages so if someone's starting to cough on clear fluids and food it's about getting that referral to the speech and language therapist to make an assessment on what's safe for them to eat and drink. But one of the things that Hannah and I often get asked about is how can we focus on a person's strengths and we know that despite a person developing perhaps more difficulties in their language and their behavior and cognition, there may be physical changes. Despite that, there's often areas of, of retained strength. And one of those areas for some people can be numbers. It can be interest in art. It can be interest in doing tasks or uh, leisure activities like playing games or puzzles or sorting things. And often one of the things that Hannah and I do is help people, direct people to um, identify new ideas or new ways of engaging people that make the most of these strengths. And one single example of that is that we um, have collected ideas from other people as well. And recently I was talking to people about watching TV programs and a, a um, 
client I was working with was saying that one of the TV programs they find the easiest to watch now is Tipping Point because it's based around numbers where previously they've been someone who really engaged with longer series and movies and I've shared that tip with many other people and they found that really helpful to know which programs are going to be more likely for their family members to engage with and enjoy. In terms of communication, however, we can do something similar. We can make the most of people's pre preserved strengths. And as a speech and language therapist, um, I would think of all, all behavior as communication. Often when we talk about communication, um, people really only focus on what people say the, and whether they can say words or understand words. But communication is much broader than this, as we all know. It's about what you're wearing that conveys whether you're um, doing a professional presentation. It's about um, use of facial expression. And when we're talking about frontotemporal dementia, it might also be about facial expression and eye contact, pointing, the tone of somebody's voice, the way they are looking, what direction they're looking in, or how they might seem. You know, overall, they might seem frustrated or a bit flat. All of those things are ways that you can look at and engage with the person's communication. And one way of doing this is actually to proactively engage people in alternative ways and means of communication. And so Hannah and I are going to now make a bunch of suggestions that you could perhaps use in everyday life. And we base these suggestions around senses, because often senses are, are things that we can really make the most of in interactions. I'm going to start off by talking about sound and singing. And I've got a list of suggestions on the slides here, but I'm just going to give you one example of having worked with a lady who had frontotemporal dementia, but was very flat. And she didn't really communicate much with her family. But when we talked about the Music, about music and the songs she'd like she'd really enjoyed singing and we started playing songs from her old list of songs that she liked one of her favorite songs was Lady in Red and when we started playing that she was really able to engage with the music and sing along with the music and start moving with the music and interact with the people around her as the music was playing but that doesn't mean just playing music it might also mean introducing instruments or even playing things on an iPad. So I've, I have played to people football chants, I've played people bird song, and that's been really a useful way of actually bringing things to them that they can hear and engage with. Yeah, another sense of sight and the importance of sight of how we connect with someone and speaking to a lot of carers, it's often that engagement, how do we connect with that person for a short period of time and the power of a photo is, is amazing and especially when someone progresses into the later stages of frontal temporal dementia these can be really powerful tools of to help the family connect with that person that they know that the dementia may have progressed and that this is a, a photo can bring a chance for you to engage with that person again and then I've had experience of a lady um, I'll never forget this engagement we had um, a group of mixed stages of people with dementia and this lady had advanced stages later stages of frontal temporal um, to mention and wasn't really engaged in the activities we were having some reminiscence objects and look people were engaging but she wasn't really um, engaging in, in the groups but then we brought out a picture um, of Churchill and we gave it to her and within a second she connected and was able to say in her own words that she said that's Churchill he he came to my street when I was younger and it was just this moment of this lady that we knew nothing about but that picture had actually drawn out a moment in her life when we could see her as the person and, and not the dementia and, it, and it, was, it was fascinating to see the impact on, on everyone all the care staff involved and really helped promote that person-centered care so a power of photo that can be used to identify someone and also improve the care um, due to carers understanding about that person and that connection so that has a real real powerful um, connection of supporting someone at the later stages and these can be used as well as people's favorite videos you can watch films together um, often we're looking at fish tanks as well engaging talking about the fish using that as a tool to really connect with someone um, and takes away the pressure you've got something to talk about often we speak to carers they really struggle knowing how to bring up mm -hmm. a conversation and these using sight pictures videos video calls can really help you connect um, the next one is touch, the power of the touch. And I suppose with COVID, especially with the 
kid knee, the gloves, aprons, the masks that we have now, often that connection is limited, especially people who might be in care homes, but it's really powerful to have that connection um, as someone is advancing into the late stages. It often gives you comfort when you, someone touches your shoulders to when you're talking to someone to know that you're listening to them, promotes good eye contact as well. And it's about using objects of touch as well that you can engage with the person and yourself. You can both hold different objects, holding things like when you do massaging, holding the hand and massaging it with cream um, gives a lot of comfort and connection. And often that can be done when someone's giving personal care as well. If someone's more agitated, maybe not able to comprehend what you're doing, but by calming someone, touching their hand can really make a powerful um, difference to someone, how they feel. And it's about using objects in the, in the house as well that can be used, such as a hairbrush. For example here, the ball, spike ball, it's something to touch and the string as well, it's an object to engage with that can be done for a very short period of time to help connect and ease, ease someone at the later stages. And also smells, the power of smells. Um, these are great ways of connecting as well. Things like flowers, herbs and fruits. Um, it's about actually getting hold of it and smelling it yourself and getting the person to smell it as well and have a, a positive, things like fresh fruit, fresh flowers, to be able to smell fresh flowers helps lift someone and connect um, with that person as well. You're sharing that experience, they can smell it, you can smell it. And it really is a powerful way of connecting and you can get things like smelly cards that you can scratch and smell things like a fresh cut grass you can um, get cards that smell of fresh baking or baby powder it's all that connection to bring that start that conversation it's not necessarily about reminiscence it's about starting that conversation smelling something oh that reminds me of when so and so happened it's that connection you might they may not be able to verbally communicate back that they're having a reaction you're able to tell them a story you're connecting with the person so the power of smells the flowers herbs is a really good um way of connecting in this picture with lavender lavender's calming isn't it you smell it it helps with sleep as well so it's uh it's incorporating smells and that texture into how you engage with someone as well which is a really important aspect and this one taste taste is a pleasure someone probably progresses to the later stage of any dementia um it's one of life's pleasures isn't it? taste brings a lot of pleasure and it's about safely tasting things that might give comfort for here we've got the ice cream or the different flavors ice cream that you could use you could spend a short period of time with different flavors and you have some and they have some and it's that taste and comfort and connection and which is really powerful with someone as someone progresses into sort of the late, later stages and you can play on this someone might have fav a favorite flavor of ice cream favorite sweet and it's about given that taste um, and experience how you connect with someone. I was trying something new as well. Sometimes you try different sweet, sour things, have different reactions. So it's about connection, using it to, yeah, you try it, they try it, and it's an experience that you're connecting and um, giving, as we say, comfort. And as someone progresses to the later stage in aftercare, it does become important. So for things like if they are um, having problems with the swallowing, it's about have opportunity to actually have a look inside the mouth and clean the mouth by tasting tasting things as well in short and small amounts that wouldn't um, prevent stop someone choking. I think it's just yeah opportunity as well to use that taste to check that the later stages they are okay or oral health is good too. So that's a way of connecting with someone too. Right. Yeah, I remember I worked with a family and they would uh, make. Uh, biscuits that they'd made at home and they'd bring them in and they go through the whole thing of smelling them and okay. then taste and they were like really traditional family biscuits that they all loved and you know all that, that mm, oh, and that was all part of the interaction I found one of the things we thought we might be help might be helpful Hannah and I um to you all as you're thinking about this kind of thing is how to do this how to communicate with the person when you're bringing in some of these objects and there's uh, this a lot of this work is based on something a type of intervention called intensive interaction and in intensive interaction the idea is that you it's a therapy approach that's been used with people in the end stages of dementia and it's based around following what the person's doing so you you follow the person's pauses and turns so you watch when they're taking a turn you wait for their pauses and then you take your turn you watch what they're doing and you watch and you listen and you observe what they're saying and you echo and reflect back what they're saying so for example in that uh, if we're talking about 
food and we, I was giving that example of the cookie, somebody bringing in the, some uh, cookie that um, it was an old family recipe and looking at the cookie and smell and going, mm, and if the other person says, mm, then the other, then echoing that and reflecting it back by saying, mm, mm, mm. and you might find that you can, you can start having an exchange of back and forth without necessarily needing words. You can touch a ball, you can offer a ball, um, you know, the sensory ball without necessarily having to talk about it. You just take turns and echoing that and creating a rhythm. So you might start by smelling the cookie or admiring the ball or admiring an orange, and then you might be tapping or eating or, so you're then kind of building on that through a different medium and really smiling and acknowledging all the time but being really prepared to find some distance. We don't propose that these types of interactions have to happen for a long period of time or need to be um, different every time. What we would suggest, Hannah and I, is that Hannah talked about making a memory box or a sensory box and really just putting together some bits and pieces that you can come back to. Like Hannah was talking about that picture of um, Churchill and I've worked with a gentleman who he'd been a boxer and we didn't know that for a long time and then the family brought in a picture of him as a boxer and we kept it and we came back to it in our interactions with him and we would only interact for very short periods of time uh, we're talking about five or ten minutes aren't we Hannah mm -hmm. yeah it's not not very long it's it's about 15 minutes of people sitting around and that engagement obviously they get more tired so it's about a time appropriate sessions isn't it and the right time of day as well yeah finding out what the best time of day is for that person watching what they do and then doing the same you know doing the same thing next time i found that doing this type of work just 10 minutes regularly um you know every couple of days or every day meant that that person started recognizing sometimes anticipating what was going to happen in that session when we brought the same objects and the same movements and the same sounds and that person actually started turning to his name more and the he was actually becoming um much less agitated or distressed when we were present and his family members were saying that they well, I, I've had a lot of feedback from these type of interactions where family members have said, or, or carers have said, oh, I don't know what to do. I'm sure you've heard that, Hannah. Just yeah, we often hear carers feel quite anxious with their sort of having to engage with someone in the late stages in their own home or visiting someone in the care home and they're not sure, they know they feel quite stressed before they get there. And it's often having these tools in your box, having, having an orange and apple or lemon in your, your bag just to bring out and show and having that engagement and um which is really powerful and it, it can change how you feel and how you connect to the person it helps you often carers feel they've lost the person mm -hmm. um and it really helps you connect back and um feel part of their life and engagement and often sometimes if things don't work out it's about trying another senses it might be a different time of day they might be tired too tired for it it might they just need to hold your hand it, it's tired there just want to sit down it, that's okay it's having these tools in the box that can really help and and sort of focusing on the person their likes and dislikes what they used to do like the boxing and the late lady who yeah who lived in London so it's about looking at how objects in London to bring back memories as well because it can open a door steps of more things to explore and, and just trying and not be disappointed if it didn't work out this time it might be other things that prevented it but it's yeah and not putting too much pressure on time and that just a few minutes isn't it I think that's really yeah. going back to sports at the moment with the football you know playing the Tottenham a Tottenham game with the Tottenham fans singing that's something I remember doing with a client and and actually he hadn't heard that for years and years and then he and then we started playing it more regularly and it was a delight it wasn't loads it was a couple of minutes each time and then family members are saying, oh, I didn't think of that. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to, I just thought I was here to chat, but actually chatting might be actually watching a video or listening to music. Chatting could be brushing somebody's hair. Chatting could be doing someone's nails. Chatting mm -hmm. could be um, giving someone a hand massage. Chatting could be um, just saying, mm, and tapping their hand. There's lots of different ways in which we can interact. Mm -hmm. So thank you very much for listening, everybody. Hannah and I are really looking forward to hearing any of your questions in the Q&A today where we will hopefully be able to chat with you a bit more.
thank you for your time yeah, thank you everyone great so um lots of of um, great advice and and um uh, both um anna um, and hannah um will be available um for some q a and i can already see some um questions coming up um on this topic before we move to the q a um we have one last um video from nikki um who is going to give us an update on um something called world ftd united which is um really a collection of um support groups similar to this um, around the world which we're part of it's about trying to um, understand the work that is done um in um, other places um in the us australia france um, uh, um and see if there are things we can learn but also things um we're doing which um, other people can learn from us so um uh, nikki is going to give us a, a, a brief overview um of that work with world ftd united hello it's me again i'd just like to update you on the world ftd awareness week from september the 26th through to october the 2nd some of you may remember from last autumn, we were part of the World FTD United Marathon, a day of talks and interviews with health professionals and caregivers across the globe. There were three legs started in Australia, moving through time zones to Europe and ended across the pond in the USA. It was wonderful to see this international collaboration, which World FTD United is all about. It is an international group of organizations who provide support for care partners and all affected by FTD. It was responsible for organizing the first World FTD Awareness Week back in 2016. At present, 15 countries are represented in the group, including Australia, North and South American countries, many European countries, and part of Asia. This year, World FTD Uniting is holding a global conversation on FTD. And we want people diagnosed, care partners, and healthcare professionals to join us as we develop a film reel of experience. We would love for you to participate, and this is our ask for those of you that are interested. Simply film a short two minute video of yourself speaking about how FTD has touched your life. What would we like you to include would be who you are and where do you live? How does FTD impact your life? What has supported you in this journey and what gives you hope for the future? If you'd like to participate and would like more details, please send me an email at contact at rarededementiasupport.org. Thank you for listening. Great. So um, if I can um, uh, get all of our panel um, to uh, get their cameras on and we'll get ready um, for our um, Q&A, I should say a, a thank you both to Anna and Hannah who are attending from their holiday, um, including Anna who is not in the UK. So thank you to you both um, for taking part um, in this um, during our holiday. So um, I, I'm going to start and try and go through a little bit in, in the order um, of the talks, but I might end up jumping around um, a, a little bit. So um, Livy, one of the questions is about how can we get GPs, and I suppose that um, also includes physicians um, elsewhere, to have more knowledge of um, support post-diagnosis for people with FTD. I, I know lots of people we hear from are told the diagnosis and and you know are, are are then left on their own it's a very good question and i'd like to start that by saying that the direct support team never discharges anybody at all and um, so please do come to us with questions and of course we um, support not only people living with dementia, their families, but also healthcare professionals. So we're very happy to do partnership working, provide information. We have professional packs, professional training documents that we can pass along. So please do um, give your professionals our, um, our contact numbers if they'd like to be in contact with us. And as well as about empowering. So previously working as a healthcare professional, I loved it when 
um, my clients would talk to me about conditions that maybe I wasn't so familiar with. So bringing information and saying that actually in this situation, mum doesn't like it in, with this, this is how this, this makes her feel. Maybe you could talk to her this way. This is how she communicates better. Do you feel um, empowered to be able to have those conversations? Because you at home, everybody listening, you are the professionals here. You have such an in-depth knowledge of FTD. And yes, we really want you to be able to share that with the healthcare professionals. But as I said, um, we do support professionals. So do give them our number and send them our way as well. So similar, similar question, similar theme, and it's kind of the same answer, but I just, um, it, it, this is from someone who um, uh, says, what can we do to put pressure on our local mental health teams? I have four residents within care homes. So this is perhaps relevant to everyone mm. um, late stage who have behavioral variants, frontal dementia, all were discharged from their mental health team. Um, without any ongoing support. So um, uh, anything to add to what you said, Libby? Yes, so this is quite a tricky question. So we do acknowledge that there's a bit of a postcode lottery out there with NHS services. In some areas, you'll find that somebody's given a diagnosis and they're kept within a service in, indefinitely. Other times you may receive a diagnosis and be discharged, but you're able to be re-referred if there is a problem or an issue which they can help with. Thinking about specifically about community mental health teams. So community mental health teams, for those who may not be aware, are teams within the community, as the name suggests, that support people living um, in the community who have complex or serious mental health problems. And um, these can include people like care coordinators, psychiatrists, CPNs, et cetera. My advice in these, um, in terms of discharge, is you can, the, the GP does remain the gatekeeper in these situations. If there is a problem which is arising, you can always ask the GP for a referral to that team. Um, if it is a case that it's a team where they will um, discharge after a certain piece of work and then allow people to come back through the system. Otherwise, um, quite similar to what I said before, at RDS, we do work in partnership with healthcare professionals. So do send them our way. Um, we can provide education. We can provide videos. We can provide so many wonderful resources and we do not discharge anybody. So yes, please do feel free to send them along. Great. And, and perhaps just on that note, I don't know whether, Livy, you can tell us just a little bit um, about the plans. I know Nikki um, uh, just been talking to me about this, about the plans for the change in the, the small groups and the peer support moving forward that we can offer. So in terms of peer support that we do offer, so um, we offer a budging service at um, Red Mentor Support, which is a fantastic resource. So we know that talking to people in a similar position to yourselves is just a, a, such an invaluable resource sometimes. So we do have a budding system. If that's something that you might be interested in partaking in, please do drop us an email and we'll do our best to match you with somebody. And that is for people living with a dementia and also their, um, their carers, family members, friends as well. Great. That's super helpful, Libby. I'm going to move on to a couple of specific symptoms that people are asking about. And um, I, I'm going to have a brief sort of say whether I think they're part of FTD or not. And then, then perhaps I'll leave it to all three of you to think about how we cope with some of these symptoms. And the first one that two people have really um, talked about is fatigue. Um, and I would say that fatigue is really a part of any neurological illness. If there is a problem with your brain for any reason, and I, I see patients um, it, it, in my um, clinic with various forms of dementia, but also I, I also am a neurologist. I see people with other neurological illnesses and, and fatigue is really, uh, a part of every illness and a difficult um, thing to deal with. So um, who would like to start on um, coping mechanisms for fatigue, Libby? Yes, so as, as you just said there, John, um, I would say that sleep in frontotemporal dementia is definitely something which people come to us with a lot. Um, 
And the first thing which I ask in that situation is maybe is there other reasons why sleep's been affected? Are they sleeping long enough at night? Um, are there any medications that are causing you to feel sleepy during the day? Um, because the, if these are possibilities, then it's often sometimes worth addressing these or changing these areas where possible. I think generic advice maybe would include looking at rooms within the house, making sure that they're well lit and have as much natural light as possible. We do know that there are studies that suggest things like light therapy might be helpful. And whilst this isn't conclusive, it might be worth trying. Um, having access and clear um, visibility of a clock. So being able to know what time of day it is. So yes, making sure that there's plenty of daylight, things to do during the day, having a timetable in place. And also, um, again, on the line of maybe reversible things, having low mood can sometimes contribute to poor sleep. And I think that's sometimes some, something which we forget. So if you think that you are in low mood or feeling depressed, then please do see a GP about that as well. I think that's right. And as, uh, one of the questions was about fatigue, even after what seemed like a good night sleep. And we might come on to that in a second. But I just the point around low mood is important really for any form of dementia. Uh, you know, I certainly have an extremely low threshold for treating concomitant depression. We know that that is something that is um, potentially treatable. Um, and so we, we certainly have a very low threshold for, for trying to address any um any concomitant depression and um, anna uh, or and um, hannah any additional thoughts about fatigue in general yeah anna i was just going to mention that often people comment they get quite fatigued in conversation or in social in interaction and in these cases i often talk about planning and routine um so planning and routine can be vital um, not only for yourself, but for the people around you. So, for example, if you are going to uh, uh, going away, for example, that's the front of my mind because I am away, is making sure that you have space to and that your loved one with FTD has space to withdraw from a, a group environment or from the family can be really helpful. Or perhaps if you are going out, having an agreement or making a plan, if you're socialising with family, even with close family, Kind of setting yourself a, a, and agreeing a time span saying in half an hour I'll check if we need to leave and similarly making routines for the day so we know that people really benefit from routine it, it makes the most of their cognition maximizes their cognitive strength so I often suggest to people sitting down at the beginning of the week and making sure that both of you are aware of your routine, having even rather than using a simple calendar, actually having a, a very simple A4 page or a whiteboard where you've written in keywords or you can stick photos or, or images up on the board. So you're both on the same page about what your routine is and including things that you might think are less part of your um, you know, make, having a social calendar. But even, for example, I was talking to somebody recently about putting the bins out or mowing the lawn they're actually an important part of your social calendar or potentially your loved ones so including those as tasks that will take up energy and um, and they're important to perhaps to your loved one with routine so with FTD because it can help maintain their routine and maintain their communication and um, that's my two pence. I'm not sure if Hannah you wanted to add something to that I could see you nodding I think, yeah, I think you both answered the question so well um I suppose it's that routine isn't it so important to have routine today to stop sleeping in the day as well and also for carers to yeah remember to look after themselves as well um and sometimes when you reflect on your day a week you realize how much you have done isn't it and I suppose it's setting that realistic expectations of what you can do um and not overdoing it knowing it's okay to have a day when you don't you have to do everything so. so a couple of questions uh, just following on from that that we've that popped up which are um are, are are there any medications to help people to sleep i'll talk about that in a second um but how do we deal with people who are wandering or or getting up at up, up at night so um the, the answer to the question about medications is, is a difficult one that there's no um great solution from from a medication point of view for sleep and in particular, the concern is that um, some of the normal medications that you might use if you were otherwise well, um, drugs in the benzodiazepine um, group or 
um, some of the drugs that begin with the letter Z, like Zopiclone, they have a potential to make people more confused um, overnight and not help that much. Um, if there is a um, sleep-wake reversal, so that you are um, uh, um, sleeping more in the day and less in the night, a trial of the drug melatonin can be helpful. There's no great evidence in FTD, but we often do um, trial that. It's uh, just a natural hormone that helps us maintain our um, sleeping during the night um, rather than the day. Um, and some of the um, uh, antidepressant drugs in the um, SSRI class can help maintain sleep maintenance. Now, we often recommend SSRIs anyway for people with behavioral variant FTD or at least a trial of it um, because there are some small trials that show that it can help modify behavior and of course as we talked about before we we have a low threshold for treating any concomitant depression so there are some drugs particularly metazapine which can help with sleep maintenance but none of those um, are ideal none of those are going to be perfect most of them are going to have a relatively minor effect so most of the things that will be around trying to help with sleep are the things that you've heard about, which are non-pharmacological or non-drug non things. Any one other thoughts about um, dealing with wandering and dealing with people waking up overnight? Livy, do you want to go first and then Hannah? Yes, um, I'll go. The first thing um, which I would say is if you have somebody uh, or you're living with somebody who does have a tendency to get up at night and walk around is maybe about thinking the environment and making it a safe environment if that behavior is happening. Um, an occupational therapist in these instances can be really good to make sure that there's lights that come on, um, that there's no trip hazards at all because that just ma making sure that that area is safe. Um, in terms of somebody getting up at night as um, I, I would be, talking to that person, maybe reminding them what type of day it is and that it's time that we should be going to, to, to bed, that we should be sleeping, using gentle touch to guide that. Um, yes, and Hannah, what would, you, what, what would you add to that? I suppose, yeah, it's quite a common, here speaking to carers, it's often a common um, issue and they find it quite stressful, especially in the middle of the night, often tired themselves and um, obviously there's the danger of it being night and not being able to see so well so like you say Libby it's about the environment good lighting um, and sometimes knowing the difference between day and night having that clock as well to tell them that it's night time especially in the summertime as it gets lighter earlier that can actually cause more wandering at night time um, but it is yeah it can be quite um, a difficult um, behavior to monitor but it's about looking at the environment looking at the bedroom as well and often good lighting and shadows as well, sometimes that can make someone appear um, more confused and more worried about where they are. We sometimes feel like they might be in an unfamiliar environment. So it's about that reassurance and reassuring them that they are in the bedroom, they're safe and maybe taking them back to bed um, and explaining them. And often sometimes it might be repetitive, but it's often that's recognized as an unmet need that they might not realize where they are and wondering and making sure like you say maybe you can um occupational therapist to look at the house look at things you can have especially with the stairs there's a risk with the stairs as well so i think you can help lower any risks that might happen at night um but yeah it's often a quite a challenging situation for carers um but it's, yeah looking at the environment mm -hmm. I, I think our bottom line is there are many things to try but there is no perfect solution and it is it is perhaps one of the most challenging things um that that we get asked about and of yeah. course um, uh, um I, I we also spend a lot of time talking about carer health mm -hmm. and the importance of maintaining care health and that's very difficult if you're awake in the night um as well and we recognize that but it, there is no there is no easy solution beyond the things we've we, we've talked about but it's worth it is worth trying all of those both medication and non non-medication. I'm, I'm going to move on to a set of symptoms which have popped up, which um, are urinary problems and dizziness. Um, and, and someone's talked about sweating. Now, all of those bits of, of what we do are controlled by part of our nervous system called the autonomic nervous system. So we have a part of our nervous system that controls our body function. 
going to the toilet, sweating, blood pressure, heart rate, um, all of those things. Now, there are some dementias in which that is affected right from the start. Things like Lewy body dementia um, and when people de develop a dementia in Parkinson's disease. But it is under-recognized that it is also affected in frontotemporal dementia as well. So we hear that from lots of people. Um, so it's commonly the type of dizziness you might get as you get up um, to stand, or you've been standing around for um, a long time. Um, and people get multiple different problems with um, going to the toilet, whether that's becoming more constipated, a change in bowel habit in general, um, a uh, um, retaining urine or passing urine more frequently. So um, the difficulty is separating them out from um, normal things that happen to people. All men, as they get older, will get urinary problems and they need their prostate checked. Incredibly common, the most common cause for men to have problems. So we, even though you have a form of dementia, it's important to check that there isn't another physical reason for those symptoms, but in the absence of your GP or a specialist finding a problem in those areas, those are symptoms that we see in front of temple dementia. Not necessarily you'll find them on, on you know, a normal list of symptoms, but they are things that happen. So let's just perhaps work our way through trying to deal with some of those. Um, maybe Hannah thinking about urinary problems and how we deal with those. Yeah, so it's quite um, an important sort of thing to uh, manage. And, and I suppose when someone's incontinent, it's about keeping that area dry and clean and looking about how you can get sort of incontinent pads from your local top council as well. And often, sometimes it's also about, sometimes people become incontinent because they don't know where the toilet is. So it's about having good dementia-friendly signs in your, in your house that says the word toilet and the picture of the toilet and take regular people regular to the toilet to see if they need to go as well. Um, and it's also when people do become incontinent, um, it's important to also monitor how much they're drinking to make sure they're passing enough that some people progressing to later stages can, swelling can be um, a problem. So it's about monitoring how much they're actually intaking and monitoring sort of how many wet sort of pads they have. Um, but it's also, if you do find it becoming more challenging, it's about getting help um, from might be a, might need more help with carers coming to visit to help with the incontinent aspect of it as well um, and speaking to your local GP as well to how to get referred to more support and your local authority as well if you do feel like incontinence is becoming an issue especially if you're having to leave the house often it's a really good idea to if you're going somewhere to plan about where the toilet might be so it eases that anxiety when you're out in the community as well um, so yeah if you feel like it's becoming more of an issue speak to your local authority about maybe starting a care package to help you support um, and deal with that that need. And there's often a local continent service. I think people don't make use of all the services that they can have locally. And maybe, you know, because you have a form of dementia, not, not sometimes GPs don't always think about the kind of services that that are on offer. And, and most local areas will have a continent service, which um, people can make people can make use um, of. Um, any thoughts, anyone on dealing with um, sweating? So um, I would say that um, um, both the autonomic nervous system, but also a bit of our body, a bit of the brain called the hypothalamus, we know is affected in front of dementia. We know people can, um, you sometimes see that um, in people who turn up in our clinic in the midst of winter in their t-shirt, or the opposite, they'll be in, in, in summer and will turn up in their um, big coat. So it's a, it is a problem. Um, and can get more of a problem as time goes um, on. So there's a question about how we might deal with that beyond keeping them in a cool room and using some medication to try and bring the temperature down. Any, any thoughts on dealing with those things? Livy? I think that's quite a tricky one, isn't it? Um, I think um, obviously keeping hydrated is massively important in this situation. And I know that it can often be challenging as carers to make sure that our loved ones are drinking and, and having as much water as they should. Um, I'd like to plug slightly that there are um, some amazing little things out there to help with this. So there's something called jelly drops um, for dementia that are incredible. And I've had so many success stories with members um, using these in the past. 
And these are particularly helpful, helpful if you have a loved one who maybe isn't drinking that much, but still has swallowing in, in, intact and can eat. And these are little sweets where I think about 95% of it is actually water. So it does help um, with hydration and keeping your body topped up with water. And in terms of keeping cool, natural fabrics, natural fibers, having things like cotton and just things which are a lot more breathable, breathable not these synthetic, um, more heavy type fabrics, which are more likely to, to keep in the heat and make you feel a bit more sweaty. So I guess they, they would be my tips, but yes, it is quite a, a challenging symptom. Does anyone else have any, any ideas? I, I just perhaps wanted to make, make um, people aware the, the, the drops you talk about, the jellies, they're amazing. They were designed by the son of somebody that had dementia and mm -hmm. recognized his father didn't, wasn't keeping hydrated. Yeah. And they are, they're an amazing invention, I think, because they are incredibly simplistic, but, but actually, you know, biologically quite difficult to keep lots of fluid within something that, that someone with dementia who isn't that responsive necessarily, but is able to take them in. Um, and I think that's right. The, you know, that the, lots of people I've spoken to have had a very, um, found them incredibly helpful when they found other things like drinking water or, you know, drinking from a cup, or much more difficult. Mm -hmm. Um, great. So, um, uh, let's move on. And I, I was holding off Anna, you, you've got a realm of, of questions around, um, dealing with swallowing. So, um, a very specific question around, uh, uh thickeners, um, and the use of them and recommendations for specific things. Yeah. So I would, um, emphasize that every local NHS or trust has a different um, arrangement with their with their thickener provider essentially. So depending on what trust you live in, um, where they you may be prescribed a different thickener. But essentially, all thickeners there's a I think there's about eight or nine that are commonly used in the UK. They serve the same purpose. Um, they're essentially exactly the same. They're just made by different companies and they are um, non-nutritionally based substances that, um, for those of you who don't know what they are, that um, you add to all fluids to thicken up the fluid. And the reason you might do this is because a speech and language therapist has prescribed or recommended them. So I would not recommend using thickener unless it has been recommended or prescribed by a speech and language therapist and the speech and language therapist team. Um, because the aim of the thickener is to uh, improve the safety of, per of a person's ability to swallow liquids, to reduce it, the risk of it being aspirated, so reduce the risk of it going down the wrong way into the lungs. And, and if things go down the wrong way into the lungs, it can increase the risk of a chest infection. But unless you've been, been recommended that following a swallow assessment by a speech therapist, I wouldn't recommend trying to invest in it. So I would say before we talk about the type of thickening you might need, it's worth trying to uh, um, go to your GP or go to your neurologi neurologist and or your relevant uh, medical professional and ask them to get refer you to a speech and language therapist for a swallow assessment. Great. So a sort of specific question, but helpful just to maybe for you to describe a, a bit a bit more about things. So the the, the, the question says, um, my mum has FTD, takes her two to three hours to eat each meal. She's finding taking tablets near impossible. And um, does this mean um, that the next stage will be problem with liquids? Um, what's the next stage and how, are things, how do things progress? That's a really good question and quite tricky to answer. Everybody is somewhat different. And we do see that people, some people develop swallowing difficulties. And um, as a speech and language therapist, we divide these difficulties into different types. So some people may have difficulties before they even get the food in their mouths. So in recognizing the foods and you know, knowing how much they're gonna have to chew, how hot they'll be, how to prepare them. So even those kind of things, you know, concentrating on their meal, and managing their appetite or having an appetite, those are kind of things can impact on a person's ability to um, eat a meal 
in a in a timely fashion but then there may also be problems some people develop more motor problems and by that we mean problems coordinating the muscles of the lip and tongue and mouth or even at the level of the pharynx so the throat and the the esophagus and the entrance to the airway so um some people may have problems protecting their airway, but not everybody. The things that we are concerned about as speech and language therapists are that if the difficulties in the mouth and throat, um, and even before that, these cognitive difficulties mean that the person is unable to eat and so they may risk losing weight. Um, there may also be alongside that a risk of the thing, something going down the wrong way and an increased risk. So not. So there's not a direct relationship between things going down the wrong way and chest infections, but things going down the wrong way can cause an increased risk of a chest infection or choking hazards that I'm, somebody alluded to. So what we are concerned about is assessing those and we can get around these difficulties by prescribing modified foods and drinks. We can get around these difficulties by suggesting people eat and drink in different Ways. So, for example, we might suggest people have smaller amounts more often. So that person's question, um, this, this strategy may address that. So, for example, I often suggest that people having a breakfast, a mid-morning tea, a lunch, an afternoon tea. And so you're having smaller portions more often and making sure that those portions are um, nutritious and, and sometimes thinking about what the issue is so looking at the environment you know turning off any distractions turning off the telly turning off the radio making sure you're sat at the table um nicely set up with a good um and and visual knife and fork and plate that the person can access but actually more broadly i would say going back to that swallow for that swallow assessment from a speech and language therapist may be very helpful to check that there is not something else going on and um, that we can't see or hear about um, and also there may be it may be useful for you to see a dietitian and um, again this is a bit different for everybody depending on where they live locally but dietitians can provide really useful expert advice on supplementing a person's diet to make sure that they receive adequate nutrition and there's actually a, a video recording on the um, RDS website um, on the Rare Dementia Support website, recorded by a dietitian, Alison Smith, um, and I, and I'm sure that we can direct you to that after today's meeting. Great, that is super helpful. Um, I'm going to move on to speech. So um, there's a question which um, it, I'll, I'll try to address a little of, and then I'll leave the rest with you. Um, but it says, are people with FTD entitled to support to help them try and relearn things they have forgotten, such as understanding of words and food hygiene safety? Any tips to be helpful? So uh, I suppose the first protocol is to say, well, what do we mean by um, having forgotten them? Um, and there will, it's worth just working out what it is um, that people are not doing and often, um, just to remind people and for people that don't know, one of the problems that the thinking problems is not so much around memory and forgetting things, but it's more around planning and problem solving and making decisions. So it's not necessarily that people have forgotten certain things, but it may be just they have difficulty forming the plan on how to do that, certainly a, a, um, um, early on. Um, but I'm going to perhaps leave with Anna the thought around um, and you touched a bit on this in, in your talk, but perhaps just thinking about um, dealing with, um, I say, forgetting in inverted commas words. Yeah, that's a really good question. And some, I think in the question, the person was asking about, are people able to access this? So um, yes and yes. So essentially um, speech and language therapists uh, locally are, Again, as Livy earlier used the phrase, there may be a postcode lottery to access some of these services. So some speech and language therapists locally can provide support around communication. All local speech therapists generally are able to provide support around swallowing advice. However, we at the Red Dimension Support and also um, in the clinic where Dr. Wu and I work, we provide a national service. So we do see people for speech and language therapy nationally. and um, 
in terms of therapy, we do provide therapy to help people maintain words, phrases, communication, and um, we can work with people depending on where the difficulty is, as Dr. Rora just outlined. Um, it depends on what is difficult. So, for example, some people who have frontotemporal dementia may de develop difficulties in articulating, others more with accessing word meanings. And, um, and so we would design an, a therapy program or an exercise program that addresses those needs. And we have found for some people, and the research underpins this, that for some people, practice can help maintain those. Um, and I'd, I'd use the word maintenance rather than improve. Great. I'm just going to quickly touch on um, two questions which were about um, specific um, symptoms. So one of them was um, about visual disturbances in people with FTD. Um, uh, and the, the question says, before my husband was diagnosed, he suffered from floaters. Now in the medium advanced stage, it's very difficult to establish what he can see and eye tests would be very difficult. I suppose the first thing to say is that people tend not to have um, visual problems in frontotemporal dementia um, as part of the illness. Um, it, it's not usually, un unlike some other conditions. Um, so for instance, um, we, we see a lot of people with um, a degenerative condition called posterior cortical atrophy, where people do have visual um, problems that are not to do with the eye, but they're due to the way that the brain processes visual things. Um, and that, so that's uncommon in front of temporal dementia because it's, it's usually due to a problem. It's the very back of our brain that controls the, the visual things. It is really difficult, as you say. So, it, it, you know, lots of visual pro problems are common. Um, floaters are a problem in the eye, the front of the eye. They're not a problem to do with the, the brain, by and large. Um, but it's, it, I agree, when people are cognitively impaired, it is difficult to access services. And I would extend that not just to op opticians, but also to dentists and to other things. And people often don't necessarily get um, the care. And you do have to try and find um, somebody who is used to um, dealing with people um, with dementia when you try to um, access um, some of those services. Perhaps from the panel then, other thoughts on, on that question in general, which is um, uh, ensuring that uh, um, people with dementia do get the right services for other medical problems that are not necessarily related to FTD. I think, I think I'll start by just saying that there's been some fantastic work done within our team, um, particularly with our um, colleague Kia, with spec savers and with educating op ophthalmologists, which I always have difficulty saying. So ophthalmologists on rarer forms of dementia and how we can, um, how, how the, those people can be treated and maybe how, um, how to access their needs and how that's different in terms of um, um, a, a, assessments of the eyes. In terms of dentistry, I had this this has been something which members have come to me with before, problems with dentistry in having a rare form of dementia. Um, some dentists or some NHS dentists will have a learning disability team which you may be able to get a referral to. These are teams which have some um, further training and understanding how to deal with people who may be more stressed in that situation and may not understand completely what is happening. Other um, dental things, there is chewable toothbrushes, for example. So if you know that dental care isn't particularly great and it's very difficult to um, brush your loved one's um, teeth, even with, even with queuing, things like that, you might want to try things like chewable toothbrushes. And these are little dissolvable toothbrushes, which you can get. Again, it's very commonly used in learning and people with learning disabilities. You can buy them online and yeah, these are little toothbrushes which will either dissolve, which have got enough fluoride in it, and are usually quite high in fluoride to be able to protect the teeth um, if you are unable to, to get in there and do very, very good oral hygiene. So I guess that's what I would add in there. 
Great. So we've got a couple minutes left. I've got I just want to quickly get through a couple of last questions. Um, someone has asked about are there any reasons besides apathy for fear of water and washing? So um, uh, that's an interesting question. I don't necessarily think I know the answer to that, apart from to say that phobias in general, for some reason, there is one or two um, uh, uh, um, research papers on this showing that phobias are perhaps a bit more common um, in people with FTD than not. Whether that's a phobia or not, I'm not quite sure. Um, I, I'd have to perhaps ask the person a little bit more to understand exactly what there was, but we know that, that certainly phobias and, uh, and, are, uh, and anxiety um, is higher um, in people with um, FTD. Perhaps just one, there is someone about dealing with anxiety and, uh, and ask whether we they can use medications like Valium or the diazepam. We generally don't recommend that for anxiety. And again, we think more, while some medications may be helpful, again, usually in the antidepressant SSRI group of drugs, actually, again, dealing with anxiety is mostly non-pharmacological, non-drug. Non and some advice from people, maybe um, Hannah or Olivia, about dealing with anxiety. Yes, of course. I think first, if I could possibly touch on that question of the fear of water and the fear of washing, um, and just maybe to mention, uh, well, of course, is it is it a fear as we know the word fear? Because many behavioural and psychological symptoms of FTD, FTD are actually triggered by our approach towards the person living with dementia in a given scenario. So for example, this could be bathing or personal care. Um, for example, if we're not tailoring um, our care delivery to their preferences. So um, in terms of bathing, and this is something which comes to the direct support team a lot that people um, may be struggling to um, bathe their loved one or to motivate them to have a shower every day to bath. Um, the first thing which we, we would say is, of course, is it necessary to bathe every single day? Um, absolutely not. If there's no incontinence issues, there's no real reason to be having that shower, having that bath every single day. And in terms of making bathing, if it is a more difficult experience, making it a more positive experience, making it a really luxurious experience, as um, Hannah and Anna touched on engaging the senses, so having some really lovely scented soaps, having music on, to make it really relaxing and a positive experience. Sometimes you can use um, activities that somebody values. So for example, um, if somebody really values seeing their grandchildren, for example, setting that up as an excuse to have a bath or a shower. But um, in terms of apathy um, as well, which we know is a symptom, which um, is very common in FTD. Um, sometimes with bathing, we might need to um, set, set things up, use prompts, cue the activity through gentle touch, physical guidance, even demonstration to help them initiate the task. Um, so that was just touching on um, what was said before about fear and bathing. And of course, this is all trial and error. And please do contact the direct support team because we can give some further advice around, around that. Um, in terms of dealing with anxiety in general, I would say, again, just to mirror what John said, that it's very common with people um, with dementia to have anxiety, and it can definitely make the symptoms of dementia worse in some circumstances. So particularly affecting the person's attention, their planning, their organizing, their decision making. So in general, I would say creating a calm environment, removing stresses that you know about, avoiding environmental triggers. So noise, background noise can be um, really difficult if it's a very busy household, if there's lots of things happening. Glare, background distractions, such as having the television on can also act as triggers. Monitoring personal comfort. Is that person anxious because they need to use the bathroom? Are they anxious because they're too hot or too cold? And also things like simplifying tasks and routines, because that can also sometimes add to anxiety if they are, if, if you're setting up a task and that person might not be able to achieve that, that can be extremely anxiety provoking. In these situations, keeping ABC charts or keeping diaries of behavior can often be really, really helpful in terms of being a little bit more of a detective and being able to see when the behavior is happening. So making um, note of what the behavior was, 
when it happened, what happened before that behavior happened, and then what happened as a consequence. And then sometimes over a period of time, you might be able to start to identify possible triggers or um, certain situations that this behavior is occurring. So for example, is the agitation happening coming up to 1 p.m. every day? And is it really because that person's anticipating having lunch and they haven't had it yet? Things like that. Great. So I'm going to try and, and draw us to a close. I've got a couple of comments and a couple of things. I, I, we, I covered all the questions and then two late ones came in. So for those that have come in late, I'll do a very quick question, but you may well have to um, uh, contact our team. So a really helpful comment, we have mentioned this before, which is if there are urinary um, or bowel problems, um, getting the local council to give you a key for a disabled toilet so that you can get into them. I know my father's disabled, we use that all the time. Super helpful if you can go around and carry around a, a, a key to get into disabled loose. Super helpful. Um, someone's mentioned about using ice lollies if for hydration in hot weather. Again, good idea. I think something we tell people tell people all the time. So thank you both, but two members for, for making those points. Quick question about whether obsessions are common. Obsessions are super common. And we've touched on that before. There's some nice videos in the past um, about that from past meetings. And if there are specific questions, um, then definitely happy to answer them. But um, thank you all. I'm trying to finish not quite on time, but thank you to um, Hannah and Anna, and attending from their holidays. Thank you to Livy, thank you to the rest of the um, um, RDS team, Nikki um, and to Claire um, and to Millie. And we're gonna finish. Um, we are very lucky to be part funded by the National Brain Appeal, which is our local charity. Um, and we're just gonna hear a short video um, from them um, about fundraising um, to finish off the day. But thank you very much. Thank you to everyone attending. Do contact us if you have any outstanding questions. Hello, my name is Eva Tate and I'm the Major Appeals Manager and Manager of the Rare Dementia Support Fund held by the charity The National Brain Appeal. The National Brain Appeal raises money as the dedicated charity for the National Hospital for Neurology and Neurosurgery and UCL Queen's Square Institute of Neurology. The National Brain Appeal raises funds for Rare Dementia Support's 2,000 members to help individuals living with rare and early onset forms of dementia, their families, friends and healthcare professionals. And we also hold several other funds for FTD and dementia research. The funding helps not only the support group meetings in London, but also the regional support groups, admin and support staff and all other associated expenses, including the new online support groups. When, when things return to normal, there are travel and accommodation bursaries available to help members attend the meetings. This year, we've raised our fundraising target to 300,000, and this will rise further to 350,000 by 2022 to develop and extend the service in the areas of education, support and research, with the ultimate aim that everyone affected by a form of rare dementia will have access to specialist information and support, as well as contact with other people with a similar condition. We apply for grants from grant making trusts, foundations and livery companies and have a wonderful group of supporters, some of whom are here today, who fundraise for us in an amazing variety of ways. We would love it if you would like to sign up to our RDS fundraising newsletter to hear more of these stories and receive news of how we can support this community. We have had people do head shaves for us. We have had um, a gentleman drive across the Mongolian steppe in a VW polo and we have lots of people who take part in runs and virtual runs as well. At the end of February, we held a gala dinner called Mission Possible, where we raised 110,000 for the expansion of Red Dementia support. And we are delighted to announce that in line with this expansion, the charity is committed to raise up to 7 million to create the world's first centre of excellence for Red Dementias. If anyone would like to discuss any fundraising ideas or the new capital appeal, um, please do feel free to email me or my colleague Alexis, our senior fundraising manager, who will speak about the innovative new ways you can be involved in fundraising for RDS, even during this challenging time. Thank you very much. Hello, my name is Alexis Gebby and I'm the senior fundraising officer at the National Brain Appeal. Um, I just want to start off by saying a huge thank you to all of you who already fundraise for RDS. We really appreciate all of your incredible efforts, especially at this difficult time.
My role at the National Brain Appeal is to look after all the amazing people taking on various fundraising activities for us. We have had people challenging themselves to run marathons, cycle long distances, climb mountains and even take on skydives, all whilst raising money for RDS. We also have wonderful fundraisers out in the community who organise golf days, hold coffee mornings, host choir and carol concerts and even shave their heads. These people ensure that more people like you can be supported through Rare Dementia support. If you're interested in becoming one of our fundraising heroes, then please do contact me. I am here to support you with your fundraising and I'm more than happy to chat about any ideas that you may have. While at the moment it isn't possible to take part in a sporting challenge or hold a big fundraising gathering in your local community, we do have some fundraising ideas such as taking on a solo virtual run or walk, hosting a quiz for your friends or family online, asking for birthday donations in lieu of going out or even donating money that you may be saving by not traveling to work or buying your daily coffee. Do get in touch with me if you would like to get involved. In the meantime, take care and we hope to see you soon.